right, hello everybody. Hi, I'm Richard Garriott. Some of you may know me as Lord British. I, I truly, truly thank you all for coming out today. With me, by the way, uh, a brief introduction, though. I'll do a little deeper introduction a little as we go on. Uh, next to me here is Mr. Chris Spears, the technical director and uh, has been operating really as the project director for Shroud of the Avatar. And on his right also is Mr. Star Long, that some of you may have seen the press release that went out yesterday. Uh, Star is also known to some of you who played Ultima Online as Blackthorn. Uh, he was the producer and director of Ultima Online and the person I give the the biggest credit for Ultima Online, uh, Mr. Star Long as well joining us, so thank you. Um, but, uh, but before we start into uh, a little bit of a presentation and we're going to show you a little bit of the in-progress shroud of the Avatar, uh, I actually want to just uh, reach out to, and say thanks to everybody at Rooster Teeth and RTX, uh, all of you in the red shirts back there in the back also. Uh, you know, a big part of our community engagement uh, that we started with our, 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 our crowdfunding campaign and uh, the rest of the things we're now doing with this close association between the development team and the community uh, was really kicked off at, uh, with Rooster Teeth uh, you know, back at the beginning of March. And so we really owe you guys a huge uh, grit of, of gratitude and thanks. We're very pleased and proud to be out here uh, showing off the game in progress. And so what I want to do is I want to start talking a little bit about uh, if we can get the presentation flipped up front. Uh, I want to take you on a little bit of a historical journey uh, to talk about what I think, how I think uh, games, uh, in, broadly the games industry and especially role playing games have evolved down through the years and how that leads us up to what we're trying to do now with Shroud of the Avatar and why I think this is a really great moment in time for role playing games to be reinvented again and then we'll show you a little demo of the, of the only three months in since Kickstarter, very early progress game. And so I think that we've sort of been on the, the quest to create the ultimate role-playing game that I've been on for about uh, 35 years, and a lot of the guys with me have been now with me on that journey for decades as well. Uh, and for me, some of you also may know that I have a, a few unusual side hobbies uh, that you might think of as sort of separate. You know, I've, 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 if you look at the history of games, I think there's been basically three, era, three eras, solo player, massively multiplayer, and now so I'm going to be talking about this, this uh, unusual concept, selective multiplayer. I've uh, built and sold uh, two companies, and we're building our third now, kind of one company for each of these eras. Uh, but along that, sort of as a hobby and an investor, I've also been a bit of an explorer, including I took myself uh, to space in 2008. I lived on the International Space Station for two weeks. And while you might think those things are really unrelated, I actually think they're extremely related. I don't know anybody, uh, and any of you I'm sure would also be just as happy as I was to get a chance to go into space. And I, I actually believe that exploration of virtual worlds and explorations of the real world are equally fulfilling. And I find that uh, you know, going out in the real world and whether I'm exploring a real world or exploring somebody else's virtual world, it inspires a lot about the creation of the virtual worlds that, that we create. And, uh, uh, and as I mentioned, I, th I think there's really been three grand eras. You know, if you look at the 80s and 90s, it was largely dominated by solo player games. In fact, before the internet, you know, Largely all games were uh, solo player. Uh, then with the, uh, really in 1997, a game that uh, Star and I uh, worked on together especially, uh, along with a obviously very talented team, uh, Ultima Online sort of ushered in the massively multiplayer era uh, that dominated for the next decade or so. Uh, but I think now we're kind of at a new juncture and while I'll make some arguments here in a minute as to why I think the time is ripe to uh, go at least somewhat beyond the traditional MMO and produce a new kind of, of role-playing game. Uh, and if you go way back to the back, by the way, uh, you know, I, my first games I wrote actually in 1974. That was the same year as the paper game Dungeons and Dragons was written. And I happened to find myself at a school that had one of these teletypes uh, uh, that uh, you could program on. And no one else in the school knew how to use it. So I, that, be, that became my foreign language. It was learning basic. Uh, and uh, produce a number of games on this machine even before uh, personal computers. And, uh, and then as I, I, I noted earlier, uh, for solo player games we started a company called Origin. Uh, the last game we did as Origin was, uh, was really Ultima Online, but since at that time EA didn't really think MMOs were a big deal, uh, they didn't really want to make any more, and so we split off, formed a company called Destination Games, which became part of NCSoft eventually to make massively multiplayer games. And now uh, we've started yet another company because we now have a kind of a new interpretation of, of where we think role-playing games can go with uh, Portalarium. 
And if you look at those three eras, other than the obvious part of solo player games you play by yourself and multiplayer games you, you play with other people, I think there's some other important things to say about it. In particular, solo player games, you know, uh, in the 80s and 90s, you would generally pay about $50 for the game. The game would come in a box. The games were usually fairly complex. You had to install. I was looking at somebody's, uh, who had those three and a half inch discs on an Ultima, which Ultima was that? Uh, Underworld, yeah. An Underworld and like five discs, you know, to where the probability of one of the discs being bad was actually 2%, I think, per disc. So by the time you installed five of them, the odds of a failure were pretty high. And, uh, uh, and so to really run a game back in those days, you had to be a bit of a computer nerd. And, uh, and, the, and computers were still pretty, pretty expensive back then. And so no surprise that the market was limited to about a million people it was a, a good selling solo player game, you know, sold to a million or two uh, people. Um, but it still had a hardcore fan base. It was still a good business up until we discovered MMOs. And, uh, and during that solo player era, that's when I got started with the Ultima series. I think I can make a good case that the Ultima series was sort of a, uh, helped really drive the definition of role playing games, at least some part of it, down through those two decades. And, uh, and that brought us up to that, se that second grand era, the massively multiplayer games. And what's interesting about massively multiplayer games is they're actually harder and more expensive than solo player games. You not only had to pay $50 of retail, but you generally have to subscribe for 10 or $15 a month. And they're more complex. Their user interfaces usually have a lot more junk on screen at any one time. So the learning curve is higher. And, but they actually reach a broader audience. Instead of just selling to ones of millions of people, MMOs now sell to tens of millions of people. And that's in spite of that higher barrier to entry. And so the only real explanation, in my mind, can be of the, of the power of playing with other real people. Uh, it was, it's so much more compelling to play with other people than just alone that people are willing to suffer through uh, you know, more cost and uh, more difficult play. And, uh, and during this era also, uh, generally speaking, you would still buy games, if not at a specifically a computer software store, um, you know, through uh, you know, f still physical goods largely, uh, even if you got it through someplace like Amazon. And, uh, uh, and it's funny that uh, for those of you who are familiar with Ultima Online, which I know a bunch of you are, uh, the, the, our, our pet name for it prior to it ever coming out, we called it Multima, Multiplayer Ultima, Multima. And so uh, I can't remember when it switched to Ultima Online exactly. Do you remember? So, so it's still pretty early in the yeah. development. Uh, but uh, as some of you know, that's still to this day the longest running you know, MMO. It uh, still has a couple hundred thousand people that play it uh, to this day. <coughs> and that sort of brings us over to the third uh, era. In my case, it goes like this. I say, look, at this point in time, most people already are now to the point where you don't really need the physical goods. I mean, other than the cloth map and things I know I want to get in your hands. But I mean, you don't need to go to a retail store. You don't need to buy it in a box. You, uh, you, you want to be able to just down download it. You generally want to be able to at least try it for either free or uh, for some uh, relatively modest cost. Once you know you really like to play it, I don't think people are, are offended by ultimately paying for their entertainment. Uh, but, uh, but as long as you are downloading things and getting a chance to at least taste them for free, it also means that they can't be that complex because if, if the instructions are too hard, if the installation and the process of getting your character started are too hard and you've not invested anything in, up front, your tolerance for that pain is much lower than it was in the MMO era. And so I think a lot of the free-to-play MMOs that have been flooding in the market are exactly the wrong kind of game for, for the future. Uh, I've played tons of them myself. They all look beautiful. You spend you know, the first hour creating your character, the second hour in a town outfitting your character, and then you see the same old exclamation points over everybody's head, and you get the same quests, and you go out on the level one you know, mining fields that are just outside the town, and you wash, rinse, repeat, and after investing three hours or four hours into something you, you didn't pay for, and it does look good, but it's not any better or any worse than 15 others that you've played in the recent months, and, uh, and, and thus, I think, is, is causing this uh, stagnation and, and uh, uh, failure in the market of a lot of uh, of the recent MMOs, um, but there are some things though that have come out recently that I think uh, are, can can save the day, so to speak, for for uh, what you used to call massively multiplayer games. One is that that you still love to play with other people, but more particularly, you love to play with people you know. You love to play, while it's fine to see strangers and you want to meet new people and you want to be able to engage both friendly, wise, and un with unfriendly behavior with strangers, you want to make sure that your actual friends are there all the time. And your actual friends aren't necessarily going to be logged on at the same time you are. 
And so you also want to provide good asynchronous gameplay features to make sure that you can visit your friends' houses or through their shops or other things in the game to make sure you can support each other even when you find yourself not online at the same time. And if we can do those, we can wrap those into one game and we can pr provide the solutions to these problems, I think now we can get to an even larger audience than we had before. Uh, in fact, I think that, you know, we go from tens of, of millions that potentially we're getting into the hundreds of millions if you look at the number of gamers we now have globally uh, that, are, that are willing to play games. And that brings us over to Shroud of the Avatar. And, and in particular, we're inventing a, a new way of organizing people in the game that we're still looking for a, a better term for. And, and you know, we're credited, rightly or wrongly, with inventing the term, the elegant term, MMORPG. Um, and hopefully we can come up with something a little better than that, a little less of a tongue twister, less of an acronym. But my acronym de jour is Selective Multiplayer. And what I mean by that is, if you think of most MMOs, one of the first things you have to do is you have to decide what shard you want to play on. But the problem with, shard, with shards is that uh, you know, all, all of us, even in this room, have some kind of continuity of the connections between us that really mean if you ask who is a friend of who, you'll eventually get to everyone in the whole room that we're, we all have connections to each other. And so no matter how you put people into shards, you are sort of by definition splitting people, and some people are going to be on that fence where half their friends are in one shard, half their friends in another shard, and they have to decide which of these they're going to live in. And even games allow you to transfer with some pain from one shard to another. You can't really constantly be playing with the people who you really want to be playing with, which is mostly your friends. And so we're actually creating this new technology, whereas instead of breaking the game up into shards ahead of time, everybody plays together in what you might consider a, a single thread of reality. Uh, and as you move through the world, we're constantly re-sharding into many shards as you move along. And so what that means is we're constantly trying to group you into the, into the map areas that have people you already know in them as the first other people in that map. Now, there'll still be plenty of other strangers, and we're going to fill it up to its capacity because we don't want to waste the servers. But as you move, we're constantly grouping you in real time closer and closer and closer to the people you already know. And so we think with that system, we'll get the, the best of uh, you know, what you might think of uh, in a, um, uh, like a first-person shooter where you, you, you create an instance for just you and yourselves. Uh, it'll have the best aspects of a true MMO in the sense of it's still going to fill to capacity with, with uh, strangers for you to bump into and meet and fight or share adventures with. Um, and so in any case, we think that as a, as a basis, uh, that's going to let us all play together in one virtual world in a very seamless way that, uh, of course, we have to prove it. But uh, it is our assertion, our belief, that, uh, that this will usher in a new kind of basis for role-playing games. Um, pardon me. Another one of the key things we're doing differently here is the close partnership we have with all of you. Uh, you know, I've got to tell you, back in, you know, before March when we were thinking about going uh, to the public for everything from funding, <coughs> excuse me, funding the game and through uh, allowing the community to participate in the creation of art and design and even code if, uh, as desired, um, it was something we looked at with some trepidation. You know, how would we manage it? Would it be successful? Would people be interested? Uh, and it was one of those junctures where you're going, look, okay, you know, we, we're either going to have to go find another big publisher, and if we do, we, we've sort of done that twice. We, we know that story very well. We know, it, we know what the good aspects of it is. It's deep pockets. They're there to support you as much as you need. Uh, but we also know it comes with, you know, it's their money, so they'll have lots of strings attached to it. And their belief about what the game should or should not be will be different than ours, and it will be different than yours. And we, we know that from repetition that that's the, the case. Uh, and very fortunately, when we ran the Kickstarter, the, uh, uh, those of you who are already backers, by the way, I thank you very, very dearly. Uh, it, uh, it now means that we don't uh, need to go uh, and, and, and find money from one of the big publishers. And, uh, and now that we've started a relationship with you, it's, it was fascinating that even at the beginning of the Kickstarter, we immediately started getting feedback as we were putting up all of our ideas. And a lot of the ideas that we get feedback on, either people were already proposing ideas that were better than we had originally put down, and there were people who might say, hey, I'm not, uh, I want you to do something different than you put down, or might be critical of some of the first stuff we put down. And starting the very first week of the Kickstarter, we began to evolve the design with community involvement. And, uh, and we went beyond that. We, uh, you know, we, we then realized we had such a, a much stronger demand than at least I would have guessed 
for people who said, look, I want to submit art, I want to submit music, I want to submit storylines, uh, and really uh, participate much more deeply in creating the world, in, in the creation of the world itself. And of course, we're creating this world for you. And those of you who've played in Ultima Online, especially, you understand that you know as much as we might like to think that some of the code base is ours, it's your world. I mean, and if we if we don't make you the world you want, we won't succeed. And ultimately, all the details are going to be in your hands anyway. And so giving you as early access to be able to make those kind of contributions as possible uh, will just mean that we're going to be much more successful in providing you what you want, which is good for all of us. Um, and as a case study for that, uh, here is a guy that uh, we know in-house, in at least I only know him as the Hairy Man. And uh, the Hairy Man is the first person whose art uh, was submitted uh, that uh, even before he put up the art guidelines of polygon counting, pixel density, etc., uh, he was already submitting stuff to us that happened to meet that specification. So in the demo, we'll show you or you'll, you'll see all these things in the game. So uh, so uh, user uh, uh, content is already in the game. Um, this also, uh, you know, as I've, uh, if you think of that, you all are now part of that team. Uh, talking about a couple other team members, uh, most of you who have been following it already know this, a guy named T Tracy Hickman, one of my good dear friends. Uh, he is a writer who was the co-author of the Dragonlance series. Uh, he also, if you, if you go on YouTube and you Google uh, or you, you search for uh, Apogee of Fear, that is a movie that I filmed on board the International Space Station. It's actually the first science fiction movie ever made in space. And uh, Tracy Hickman wrote that film for me. Uh, and then his, him and his sons edited it. And in uh, any case, you'll, you'll, you'll either find it hilarious or you'll, you'll think of a complete idiot. So it'll be up, for you, up to you to decide. Um, but uh, he has now uh, joined us as the chief architect of the, uh, the main story within Stroud of the Avatar. And I couldn't be more pleased to have him on, on board with us as a, as a project. Now, the other person who I already introduced briefly, Star Long, who uh, again, uh, for those of you who played Ultima Online, know him as Dark Star. Uh, he, uh, and as I mentioned, he's the, he was the character Blackthorn in Ultima Online. Uh, but uh, I gotta say, Star has, uh, he joined us at Origin when he was much younger, when we were all much younger. Uh, you know, I heard, in fact, I had, I had forgotten the story you told earlier about how you, you answered the ad uh, in the newspaper to uh, become a QA tester. And, uh, you know, which is kind of the classic way to get into a, a computer game company. But, I got, but by the way, this guy's rise through our company was meteoric. Uh, I think he went from you know QA to uh, being a project lead in QA to joining the Wing Commander team. I think first, uh, or what, what other no, what was, other projects? I, no, it was you. I, I, I did you go straight was, to, to yeah, two and a half years for to, yeah. to be a director. So. so yeah, from zero to two and a half years to being a project director. So anyway, phenomenal. I'm very pleased and proud to have uh, Star Long on the team, and I'd love for you to say a couple words if you'd like. Thank you, Richard. Always kind words from you. Uh, I'm incredibly excited to be working on this project and, and there are innumerable reasons so I'll try to keep it brief in the time we have. Um, the big, you know, For me, uh, multiplayer games are the best expression of games in general. If you look at the history of games, like the very first one we know of is this ancient Egyptian game. It was a form of backgammon and it was a two-player experience and to me, games are social experiences, games that you play with your friends, your family, uh, other players. And so that social aspect is really exciting to me. And I think that crowdfunding and crowdsourcing has brought it to its logical extreme where before we as game creators were the only ones who could really will into being a game. That, 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 was, that was what we did. And, and now we're at, at a point in the industry where you as backers and, and co-creators as crowdsourcing, you, you also can will these things into beings. And, and games that you want and, game, and products that you want that you decide, I want this thing and I can, I'll, I'll help make it and pay for it before it even exists. And, and it's just this incredible time and opportunity that we all have, not just as, as game creators, but you as consumers as well. So I, I, and to get to work on a project you know, with my old friend and uh, colleague Richard, that is deep in that, and 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 really exploring those boundaries of what it means to be a social game, what it means to be a multiplayer game, what it means to make a game with the community is just incredibly exciting. Thank you. And uh, and now, last but not least, I'm going to reintroduce uh, Chris here. I think on the next slide, if you'll advance one for me. And uh, and and Chris Spears here uh, is another longtime uh, work associate. We've worked together for about a decade, I'm guessing. About a decade. And um, uh, and he, uh, you know, as we've uh, been building Shroud of the Avatar, he's actually been 
the person who really, you know, he's technically the technical director, but he's really been the project director and the parent of the office and the, you know, coffee maker and the breakfast server. I and stay busy. You turn the lights on in the morning. Film, he's filmmaker. The in, he's the first guy in in the morning, and he's the last guy out every evening. I think every day. I don't think there's ever been a day that that I've been in, and I try to be in there as early as I can too. I don't think I've ever beat him in or beat him out. I I appreciate you reminding my wife of all that, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I hear enough Sorry. about that. Uh, no, I mean, uh, yeah, no, I mean, uh, <laughs> take that back. But uh, anyway, very pleased and proud to have Chris uh, here on the team as well. If you would feel free to uh, mention, make a few comments, or jump right into the demo as you see fit. Uh, I'm sure we'll take questions afterwards, but I just want to say uh, if there's any game developers out there, I know one of the things I've had from my friends is they've been shocked that I've been excited to actually work with fans on things. And just as a, a long time, maybe it's uh, the egos in the game industry or whatever, but there's any time you talk to a game designer, it's like, oh, fans, they don't know what game designers are. But the thing I found is it's not that we're getting just every idea is great, but it starts a lot of discussions onto things, which lead to great things. Uh, it's also great just to get the community feedback and get really get those discussions. And even looking on the forums where you see these these uh, threads of discussions that page long replies, and I think there's some threads in there that are a uh, hundred pages long if you actually go and read them, which I can't, by the way. <laughs> we do have a few people to go and summarize them for us, though. Oh, and I do want to make the remind people of the bullet caveats that were up on the screen, uh, you know, which is that uh, don't forget, you, you know, most games you don't get to see until they're pretty close to done. That's sort of what you do, is the people work on a game and when it's in the beta process near the end and it all is you know, relatively shiny and you can smoke in mirrors the places that aren't finished, uh, you showcase the game. In this case, we're making the game fully in view. I mean, we literally, I think if any of you watch on our, uh, our, our, our broadcasts, uh, you'll see that uh, uh, you know, even our concept art, much less the art as it's created, much less screenshots of the game we're putting up, and so you're seeing a game here very early. This is literally the first time it's been put together as a full demo, and you guys are the first people to see this demo. Uh, but please understand that that's what you're hearing, is you're seeing a game three months into, into production. And just so people know, one of the things you shoot for early on in a game is trying to set a visual bar for game or for the game, and so and, this and was... the, yeah, what you the demo you saw, for those of you who saw anything we put together for, um, uh, for Kickstarter, it was all off-the-shelf parts and pieces and whatever Unity would do natively. This is the first time what we're showing here is not entirely brand new art. It's in, we, we cheated here just for the demo to put in a few buildings or trees and we didn't have any. Uh, but, uh, but as a general rule, this is now the final form of the game. Uh, you may know that, that we're going back, like some of the earlier Ultimas, to a two-scale map. Uh, Chris is running around the outdoor uh, map right now. Uh, and I think, uh, uh, so you can see the birds and animals running around. Uh, uh, there's both, there's points of interest that are fixed on the map. There's points of interest that are moving around on the map, like monster creatures, creatures and that dragon that just uh, flew by. But, uh, but let's go ahead and step in uh, right now. I think uh, Chris uh, uh, is gonna head into his, his house and uh, maybe do a little bit of crafting. Is a, a big part of what made Ultima Online, I think, so powerful and unique was that unlike most every other MMO where people are first and foremost the combatants, uh, it's those non-combat roles that I think uh, really what made UO special and what we're really trying to recapture here. And so, uh, yes, it is. Oh, I was just making sure it's, we're doing 16 by 9. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, so if yeah, it looks that's... a little off, it's a uh, perspective difference. But, uh, but here we're out uh, uh, at, the, at, at the top side of this town. He's come in and we're going to run down and let's see what we see back in the town. And as we come into town, there's a tavern here on his right, Fire Lotus's Tavern. For those of you who've been following us uh, in our blogs, uh, uh, you saw that being drawn in real time. We'll go back and visit Fire Lotus's Tavern here in just a minute. Uh, but back in here is, uh, he's uh, playing as a knight here, so he's got a knight's house. Uh, there is his nice house, and this is a player home that uh, a lot of you who have already been backers will actually get a house very much like this. Out here in the front yard, he has a couple of crafting stations. He's got a sawmill as well as a carpentry table. Uh, but uh, let's see, do you have the supplies you need to do any carpentry yet? No, he doesn't. So actually, he might have a little bit, but he's not supposed to have enough. <laughs> But, uh, but, but since he doesn't have what he needs, uh, let's, uh, let's, head off, uh, let's head off to the forest and see if we can bring, get some logs 
to uh, come back and use on the sawmill, and, and we're cheating a little bit to teleport out of town, by the way, so normally you would have to exit the town, we think, but uh, here we are back outdoors, and uh, even as movement speeds vary based on terrain, by the way, the, the roadways are very safe and we move very quickly, off-roading is a little slower, the woods a little slower, uh, like you mentioned, there's both the fixed uh, points of interest, like the town or a dungeon, there's mobile, mobile points of interest you saw, like uh, the animals, but, uh, but also there's random encounters that can just pop up and uh, uh, based on the terrain type. You can go to any, any of those outdoor tiles you can zoom into and see it at a at more detailed level. So that's what he just did here is he's just jumped right into this forest area and uh, he's going to look for uh, a, a special tree that, to make uh, is particularly good for uh, making furniture. I, we named it, we named it uh, Francisco, what did we name it the other day? We called it a fire, Fireleaf tree, right? Wasn't that what we named it at the office the other day? But, um, oh, but along the way, though, he ran into a couple of spiders, it appears. Oh, and while he's there, he can loot the corpse, of course. In this case, he's getting uh, uh, some uh, uh, venom sacks, which you might be able to put to use in a little crafting a little bit later. Uh, those giant pine cones that he's running past there are some, just showing you the way physics objects working in the game as well. And there's one of the trees uh, up there on the side of that hill that he'll go up and see if we can't harvest some logs from to go and do a little bit of carpentry. And sure enough, we got a little bit of wood off that tree. If he wants, he can see, see if he can harvest some more. up the resources available on that tree for now, but uh, let's see if we can take this back to town and uh, see what we can make. And in terms of the uh, fans getting involved, I just want to point out if you saw the earlier demo and the outside looks different and is controlled different and very different. Uh, we had a fan who actually made a video who kind of prototyped uh, Dom John, who actually is one of the space bards who made one of the videos that uh, actually we'll probably show here at the end. Uh, but he sent a video prototyping of how what he thought would be better, and we actually integrated a good chunk of what he sent us in terms of it behaving more like it does inside the towns and being able to scroll the camera around and move things around. Ah, you might also hear that little buzzing sound. Uh, that's the Tesla Tower that's over there. So uh, uh, a lot of the major cities that happen to be near uh, easily available energy sources, uh, falling water up in the top mountains for wind, uh, geothermal locations, uh, we're allowing those cities to offer a little better protection than some who don't have that level of, of uh, technological advancement, shall we say. And so uh, uh, this town is relatively speaking, free from invasion. Uh, the overrun of towns, including the ones where you live, is actually a big part of the storyline of this game, so real estate in this town might be a little more costly than some others. Uh, but here we're going to the sawmill. Uh, it pulls out a log or two on the sawmill, and by the way, the way this works is, you notice he's not going to a recipe or a spell name or anything else. He's not going to a list of uh, skills in his, in his uh, inventory. He's just putting out the ingredients that he thinks he would like to use in operating the equipment. So if you, if you think of it, if you actually know the recipe, you should remember that, okay, it's if I put logs on the table, I get some boards. If I put boards on the table, I get some dowels. And then it's up to you to, to uh, use the devices to create the subcomponents that you need in order to, uh, be, to be able to make uh, the new pieces. So I think he's gotten what he needs uh, here off the uh, crafting table. I mean, excuse me, off the sawmill. And now he'll go over to the carpentry table. And now with the carpentry table, uh, he happens to, uh, at least if I remember correctly, it takes two boards and four dowels to make a chair. And so he puts uh, two boards and four dowels uh, out on the carpentry table. Puts it to work and he gets uh, one little tiny chair stuck over in the corner. But, uh, you get the general idea. And uh, so now we can take that chair back and let's, uh, let's go explore his house and let's see where we want to put down a chair and uh, what the best place to have a sit might be. 
Uh, and by the way, since uh, this is his house, uh, you can redecorate everything you want, anywhere you want, not only within the structure of your house, but within the boundary of your owned property. So uh, your ownership is a lot, and so that way you can put things in the garden and flags or totems or whatever you might want on the inside or the outside. Uh, and then as you move things around, I think he's got a chair there in the scene, uh, and so we already have it to where you can redecorate uh, as it is, and uh, he can just uh, in 3D push things around on the floors, the walls, as would be appropriate for, for item. Uh, but let's go back up on the top and just take a look around, and you can see through this town um, some of the different kinds of houses that people have. And uh, I can see a, let's see, is there a wizard's tower over there somewhere? There's a wizard's tower. And uh, uh, there's a druid's house around somewhere else in view on one other side. But at least a few of the, not the fun new forms of housing are, are beginning to go in as well. And here you can put the chair out, wherever strikes his fancy. And uh, go have a seat. Just to, I don't know if, for people who have played Ultimas, even the earlier Ultimas, sitting in chairs was always like one of the, one of the holy grails that was always hard to do. Uh, especially in tile graphics, man, it was really hard. And so sitting was always a big deal for me. I mean, I know a lot of games do it these days, but you don't know how much I struggled to make sitting work in those early games. Okay, so let's, uh, let's go have a drink. We, 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 just, we just did some hard work building the chair. Must be time to go visit the tavern and, and quench our thirst. Ah, one of the nice things too about this is, so here's the bartender, and you might want to tip up the camera a little bit there just to make sure we can see everything. Uh, but you know, in one of my other critiques of a lot of MMOs is not only exclamation point over people's heads, but then the menu-based conversation, you just click on all the things that don't obviously piss somebody off, and then anything that's relevant will have been said, and anything that's important to remember will be copied into your, into your uh, quest log. Well, in this case, he just talks. He's not, in, he's not invoking any form of conversation. There is no menu of any kind. You stand in front of the bartender and you say in English whatever you would like to say to that bartender. In this case, you said... Hi, my name is Chris. And since he said, hi, my name is Chris, the bartender recognized that he was introducing himself and that he used his correct name as his introduction. So the bartender will now remember him by name. And say what you're saying, I can't remember the typing, so... Oh, what's on tap? And he says, hey, we have many varieties of ale and beer. And now Chris says... I'll have a beer. <laughs> Thank you, Star. <laughs> Can't multitask. Yeah. And, and the bartender said... Did you read it? Uh, I, I missed it. Oh, yeah. Right there. So anyway, I think what the bartender said was something like, uh, uh, yes, we have some new Britannia ale yep. coming up as a fresh keg right now for you. And now Chris is telling him, hey, what, what are you doing, Chris? He's saying, I've been making chairs. I got thirsty. Chairs? Well, we have many wooden ones. He says, ah, but we could sure use some more comfortable chairs. Not like that throne of bone, obviously. What thro it? What's the throne of bone? Chris asks again in English. He says, well, he, somebody, one of you guys just has to read it there. Well, you tend to hear things, and there's a dungeon not far from here. A recent tremor opened, awakening things best left sleeping. A few villagers explored the upper regions. Okay. What did they find? But you'll notice you were having a full conversation in English with no conversation mode, no, no things being obviously flagged as the one thing you must remember, nothing being copied into a quest log. It is literally a conversation, and what you make of it is up to you. And he says, yes, step in the dungeon. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> and so now... Said cool story, bro. And so uh, basically the partner says, hey, you know, if you happen to go knock off that old lich, you know, people around here would probably be very thankful. And so basically you've been told you've sort of been sent on a quest. But again, uh, it's up to you. So uh, in this case, let's, uh, let's go see if we can do, if we can dispatch that lich and find that throne of bone and maybe bring it home and call it our, call it our own. So now we run out of town. And uh, 
conveniently, there's a dungeon nearby. <laughs> Watch out for the wolves. Okay, so now we're in the in the crypt. And we'll see if we can find our way down and to the lich's lair. And in, in down here you'll see a variety of physics objects. You can kick the skulls around, you can open up all the different uh, sarcophagi, see if you can find any items to loot or some other monsters jump out of you. So you get a little bit of extra armor bonus here. I think it's also worth mentioning the crowd sharing stuff that we're going to be doing because this dungeon set will ah, probably yeah. be one that we're going to share completely. Yes, that's a good point. You know, when when we uh, uh, we're asking people to you know share art with us, for which we're actually we're, we're, anybody's art we use, we're paying them for that art. Uh, but we're also doing the reverse, which is you know, we find that when we go look through, for example, at dungeon sets, it's actually pretty hard even in, in looking at 3D asset stores to find really good, complete modular dungeon sets that we think you know are at the professional level and so anything that we're having to go build because we can't get it crowdsourced we're going to put right back into the community so we're, we're we're sharing our art back to all of you as a thank you for people also sharing art with us and part of our hope with doing that is also that we can get people involved in doing fan art and doing fan apps and yeah, exactly. So everything anybody we can get any machinima stuff, or maybe we can get the Rooster Teeth guys to make some cool videos. You never know. Watch out! Yeah, run by these guys. They're running along here. Yeah, so he's gonna he's gonna zip through here at a fair clip. Uh, but obviously, you can see there's plenty of combat. Oh, that was one thing I meant to mention about combat. We actually have a this is combat version one. Stand toe to toe and hit each other till you're dead. Uh, that is clearly not the uh, the concept we have for combat. Oh, and this is a puzzle that we ought to mention here too, by the way. Uh, this is, again, just an example of the puzzle solving we want to make sure we put into all of the scenarios of the game. Uh, this one is a, a puzzle where he has to turn all of these torches to red from the more sinister blue. And uh, if you go around and do it in an efficient way, uh, or not. <laughs> so uh, he's going to try to... Uh, each time you touch one of the torches, it uh, uh, it turns some of its neighbors uh, to various colors, and we'll see if we can figure out how to. Which he did. He got the he got the door open on the far end of the room, but also he's now being attacked by the guards. But the combat that we're developing. Oh, that's another very important thing to point out. Most MMOs, you see a lot of user interface on the screen, and you notice that the majority of this demo, you've seen effectively none. All you've seen at the bottom is usually your hit points and mana bar and an experience point bar underneath that. Now while he's in combat, you see a little bit of a shortcut bar along there, but nothing in the shortcut bar yet. Uh, but that's our whole intention, is that nothing is on the screen unless it is absolutely necessary. We're trying to completely make the game as devoid of UI as possible. And um, yeah, thank you. Uh, here's a bit of a little spiky puzzle to try to get through. Monsters coming at him from the sides as well. Uh, here is a sealed up passageway that he can break his way through. And sure enough, he's now found himself in the Lich's lair up there on the top. And behind the Lich, you might uh, just be able to see through his smoky essence the bone of the throne of bones. And of course, we have a very, still we're in the primitive combat era of the game, uh, so he did the, the, uh, uh, the Lich has yet to have his special attacks and special effects and things of that nature, but uh, you at least can kind of see where we're headed. Oh, and the skeletons have followed you in. <laughs> I have a suspicion you might not win this combat for the first time. Ah, ah, poor Lich. And, uh, and by the way, for carrying things home, like perhaps this Bone of Throne that you might find up the staircase here, um, we, all items we're doing, encumbrance and other things with them, we're trying to keep it as streamlined as simple, you know, large, medium, small, and giant objects. Uh, but yes, you're allowed to, to carry that Throne of Bone home 
but for today, to wrap up our little demo, why don't we just sit in it and take over the Lich's Lair here. And uh, soon enough, we're going to keep taking over. Thank you. Thanks, thanks. So that's our, uh, that's the demonstration of the game. Uh, I hope you, uh, you know, you, you like what you've seen so far. Again, three months into about a year and a half project, so uh, uh, for a first, uh, a first demo, uh, we, I think we're, we're pretty pleased with it anyway. I want to flip back to the, we have one more thing we want to share with you before we uh, uh, go to some questions that we have some time at the end. Uh, the group called Space Bards, for those of you who did not participate in uh, the Kickstarter with us, we ran a, a, a community contest for somebody to come up with the best video about the game. And we had, I don't know, there were probably six that we thought were completely awesome. But this one was by far the most awesome. And, uh, and so anyway, we wanted to share this with you before we do a little Q&A. And also, you should uh, watch Star's reaction, because I just found out he has not actually seen this video. Oh, he somehow okay. managed to get through the Kickstarter without seeing this. <laughs> Awesome, yes. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it, 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 for those of you, uh, it's, it's kind of an internal joke of the team, really. But you know, that guy standing there is the gypsy in the gypsy wagon. When we first were doing the UI for the avatars, uh, you know, uh, uh, what, do you, what do we call that? This is inventory. Uh, that was the image. For so up until just before this demo, that was the avatar. Was that guy as a gypsy? <laughs> but uh, in any case, th thank you all so much for supporting us in the past. Thank you all so much for coming out here today. Uh, if we have a little bit of time left, how are we doing on time? We've got about 15 minutes. Okay, then uh, we'd be while. happy to take some, some questions if people have any. And there is a microphone right there in the center in the back. Uh, so, <laughs> so, 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 so feel free. <laughs> There's a race. There two yeah. I didn't get to check. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so I did not get to participate in the Kickstarter. Is there, are there any av options available for those of us who might have missed it? Absolutely. Um, and it's go to the shroudoftheavatar.com. And you'll you'll see the wide variety of of, uh, of ways you can still participate. We, f 
for we did some uh, we, did, we did some special things for the people during Kickstarter, uh, but uh, a, a, and what we're trying to do to make sure people join as soon as they can or are willing or are interested is uh, we're going to be running some specials each month. So uh, uh, I can't remember if it's already up on the website. The the July specials it is up. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So you'll see we we have a whole bunch of new stuff that we're giving out just for the month of July, really in celebration of uh, Star joining the team. They're. Uh, they're, they're Dark Star themed items that all of our previous backers, plus any new backers during the month of July, will receive. Thank you. Also, my friend told me to say hi. All right, friend. <laughs> hi, friend. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Uh, so, I noticed the string passing system and the whole conversation system that you guys have in there. How detailed is that going to be? And are you guys going to do some voice communication as well, or just typing? Uh, Chris, why don't you take that one, since it's a technical question? Uh, so we've got a pretty extensive language parser and just how picky we're going to be is kind of the questions we're running into. Uh, if anyone knows uh, Lum the Mad okay. is what he goes by, what he went by in, uh, uh, he was an life. old, in a previous life, but he's a pretty well-known guy and he's, he's in charge of the conversation and he wrote that the conversation system is kind of owning all that type of stuff. Uh, but it should be pretty diverse. I mean, the, yeah. the theory is, if you go back to old Ultimas, it was name, job, health. You know, and um, uh, and so he knows they better answer to those. And, and uh, but 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 beyond that, the theory should be anything that through conversation you would get a hint from their conversation to ask about, he better they better respond to. And so uh, it should be pretty diverse and pretty uh, free form and forgiving. And they should feel like they have a pretty <coughs> large library of things they can talk about. We've talked about it in one of our uh, dev chats, but they have uh, information that's taken from the area that they're in that's all layered on top of what they're job role is, which is also layered at the top on like, you know, city specific stuff. Oh, okay. And it's also all tied in with the flag system so that it really can be tied to you and also what things you've said to them. It's not just going to be walk up and say word X and he'll say word Y back. See There's really a lot of context to it. So uh, that, that looked like a really bold move that you guys made. That's yeah, it's, it's interesting. It, you know, uh, I'm, I'm sort of caught between the feeling of boldly going old school yeah. And trying to invent some really new paradigms, and um, uh, and so I think our uh, uh, selective multiplayer is uh, you know yet to be proven, but I think it's going to really be an advantage to uh, keeping everybody together in the same world. Uh, and I think our conversation system also uh, is is going to be a slightly old, a new version of old school that I think is going to make people feel like they're really exploring the world, unlike most role playing games these days, uh, or a lot of uh, the role playing games these days. Uh, so, uh, so yeah. So anyway, I'm I'm pretty pleased with our direction, and it also a lot of it's coming from you guys. Also, are you guys looking for engineers? I am an engineer. Absolutely. Drop a resume. Drop a resume to this guy. I will. And thank you very much for explaining where the word avatar comes from. Absolutely. I've been trying to tell people that's a Hindi word. Yeah. No one believes me. <laughs> <laughs> um, I noticed that you implemented um, resource gathering. Are you intending to have a more player-driven or um, server-side economy? Uh, it's going to be mostly player driven. There's a large amount of crafting involved in the game. We're kind of looking at that as one of our equally important to combat and the adventures and trying to balance the economy. I was just having a conversation with some people out here before, but it's going to be very player driven. There's going to be most items can be crafted, and it's not just going to be go out and find loot off creatures and bring it back. There'll be some of that, but it's also going to be very okay. player driven and also locality based as well. Yeah, I was going to say the same thing, just to that. Uh, uh, almost all of the interesting stuff we think is ultimately going to be, be player driven. Yeah, and, and the, we, we've had some really interesting talks actually within the last week as, as, because I'm really passionate about the crafting too and I want, I want the players, the things they make to be at least as powerful as anything you could find if not more powerful or more unique than any items you would find adventure. And, th and that's one of the reasons as a team we're so excited to have Star back on the team. You know, if, you know Ultima 1 through 9, I kind of think we're kind of cool. But Ultima Online and the, the professional interrelations between uh, crafting and supply and demand was, was still stands as, I think, one of the, the best ways that's ever been done. And Star is the guy that really drove that. And so uh, having Star back on the team, I think, is going to really make sure we succeed at that part of this mission way better than we could have w w before he was stiff-armed into joining us, rejoining us. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's a lot that I want to know more about this. I'm very excited about what I see so far, but I'll stick to what I know. Um, what I was listening for 
was you know the the music and the sound. Um, so far, it seems like it's just MIDI and sound libraries. Will that move to more traditional Foley and you know recorded orchestration, or will it be mostly what we're what we've seen right now? You want to ac answer technically, then I'll answer an art qu art, yeah. art question. So in terms of filling out the teams, we mentioned we just got funded three months ago and really just got started uh, in earnest three months ago. One of the positions we haven't filled, and we're not sure when we're going to fill it just because it's something that can be put off till a little later, is our audio engineer. So that's something that if it feels like last time it was programmer art and bad audio, this time it's just uh, bad audio. We've actually got some real artists on the team. So we'll probably be filling that position. Hopefully that'll be a little more uh, and, and, respectable. And from an artistic standpoint, you know, um, it, it, it's interesting. If, as I reflect on Ultima Music, my favorite Ultima Music is actually from Ultima's three through six, uh, by music by, made by a guy named Ken Arnold. And there, when we had very simple three voice music, it was because it was long enough to not feel repetitive, but melodic enough to remember. I can still remember most of the early Ultima music, and I'm sure a lot of you who play a lot of Ultimas probably could say the same thing. Plus, for example, Stones by YOLO is another piece that you, you know, it's hard to get out of your head. And so, even though I'm perfectly fine to do orchestration, I'm actually less worried about the technology of its delivery as that I am about that fundamental aspect of its orchestra, of, of, its, uh, of its composition. And so, uh, I'm going to be looking for you know, early Ultima style melodic composition, and but we will also be looking for highly detailed Foley work in the actual sound effects of the environment. How the, how rich the environment sounds is a huge part of the suspension of disbelief right. uh, and mood setting and things, as you know, must know based on your question. All right, thanks very much. Mm -hmm. Uh, hi, uh, I'm looking really forward to what you guys are coming up with. Uh, I kind of got on the Ultima bandwagon a little bit late in life. I'm going back and kind of doing all this. So it's really cool seeing all the stuff as it's coming out. Excellent. Um, my question was, I know that's, yeah, you're only three months into this, but if you started talking about character advancement, uh, two examples, like when you're talking about advancing in other games, I mean, the Warcraft model is more numbers, more numbers, more numbers, more numbers. How many numbers did you see? None. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, and on the other end, we got, I guess you could say the more the, the Skyrim one, which is where you like you, you got those sets of armors and then you use them for a long time. There's not too much difference depending on what you're wearing. As much as you're playing the game, I was just wondering, is there anywhere in that scale you guys are trying to sit towards, or you got something? Well, else? I can tell you for sure one that we're vo uh, we're very much away from, which is the World of Warcraft model. <laughs> uh, we're definitely not doing the exponential growth of anything. 500 uh, plus strength. And, uh, uh, you know, we, we haven't, thank you, <laughs> and we, we haven't set the fundamental un internal numbers even remotely at this stage, uh, but, but in our discussions, we're definitely looking for something that's pretty flat, <laughs> and we're also looking for something where, uh, you know, while the most important, e even, um, we actually don't, ha the, the, the classes are really more uh, skill-based. And so uh, it's not something you have to decide up front. You know, one of my big frustrations of role-playing games in general is that the first hour of decisions you make, which are relatively permanent, if not completely permanent, you make before you've ever even played the game. And so what you look like or what class you want to be, uh, you know, why should I have to answer that question until I'm much further into the game and just let it unfold in real time? And so we're developing a system that uh, uh, it's not quite like the UO system. The UO system was completely use-based. And, we don't, and we're not at least convinced that we want to go, strictly speaking, that extreme. Uh, but it's close to that. Uh, at least the current trend of the discussion is that you, you're still fairly open to suit out on any given day uh, to play whatever role you wish to play during this, the today's adventures with whatever, whoever you're adventuring with today. Mm -hmm. And uh, one more th quick sure. thing. Um, are you guys thinking about distribution yet, like through Steam or Origin or something like that, or are you just going to try and self-publish? It's the first time I've heard somebody say Origin to me in that context. <laughs> <laughs> it's very, very disconcerting. Very freaky. Yeah, but, uh, uh, yeah, for those of you who don't know, our company was called Origin before it was acquired by EA, uh, and then they ran us all off. And so to have it come back as now they're using it as a name for a way to digitally distribute products it's from our company. It's like, what? <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, no, we, we, we've thought about it. We don't have a complete plan yet. We're going to have to get you know, further along. We'll, we're we're going we're to stay as independent as possible as long as possible. Um, but in the end, of course, we want to be as widely distributed as possible. And whether that's Steam or Origin, 
uh, or, uh, or any other traditional or nouveau ways are yet to be determined. All right, but but it, fundamentally, we will allow it to be digitally distributed. But we'll also ship packaged goods for cloth maps and <laughs> that kind of stuff. So even if, and by the way, even if you buy it digitally, we'll still find a way to get you the cloth map so, and other trinkets, so fear not. That was one of my first mantras. The first, one of the first battles I think we ever had was, damn it, we're going to have a cloth map. First there's, there's, no, there's no debate on this subject. There's going to be a cloth map. I think we have five minutes left, so yeah, let's take a few more here if we can. Well, you just answered one of my questions. I was going to ask if you were going to have a physical distribution. Yep. Um, and secondly, you mentioned uh, player shops and you showed some player housing. I was wondering if uh, along those lines, would there ever be like uh, player-owned taverns or inns? This game. Ab absolutely. So we, we, we think all the best uh, things will happen when you give control of as many aspects of the game mechanics to players as, as we can. Okay. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, hi. Um, I'm like a big fan of the uh, earlier Ultima ones, and one of my favorite things from that was the virtue system. I was wondering if that was going to play a role here, like how's that going to affect game mechanics or like character decisions? Yep, uh, the, the answer is yes. They're, the virtues will play a big role in this game. Uh, not prepared to yet describe how, and even when it's well settled, I'm, sure not, I'm still not sure I should let you know. Uh, that, <laughs> might, that might be something that's best discovered, if you know what I mean. Uh, because uh, I think that was one of the real magics of Ultima 4 was that most people went into it without really understanding what was going to be asked of them from a virtue standpoint. Yeah. And so, uh, uh, so while I'm happy to kind of beat around the bush, I think I'm, I'll, my intention, well, first of all, I, I can't really tell you much about the insides of the bush right now anyway, <laughs> uh, but, uh, but as, it's, as it's now gelling between me and Tracy, uh, I suspect I'll keep that fairly quiet, uh, but the short answer is yes. But even the early ideas you shared are really yeah. cool. And it's new. It's, it's, it's both things that you'll recognize as being somewhat familiar, but I think there's a couple of very powerful new twists uh, that I think you'll like. Oh, awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you. Go ahead. All right. So far you've mentioned basically you know, you're earning the player-owned business is from you from Ultima Online, as well as taking our suggestion it, and ideas and everything in the development in the development phase of Shroud of the Avatar. Mm -hmm. What I'm wondering is, does that add extent into dungeons, but both in the, oh. in the development phase and for those of us who want to hold our own treasure hunts sometimes? Uh, yes, actually that's a excellent question. It's something we've talked about, but uh, We've talked about it at the very least, including something that we've bandered around as treasure maps, giving people the ability to you know, at the, at begin that process. But uh, to me, and I'm not, by the way, I'm by no means I'm promising this or even suggesting we could, we'll be able to get there, but I would really enjoy getting to the point where people could basically be dungeon masters you know, and take loot that they or their guild have accumulated and find a way to lay it out into the world. Uh, but I don't know yet of a zero-sum game but it, that is still compelling. In other words, you, you can't let people invent treasure and give it to their friends, and so it has to all come from somewhere. Uh, but that's something we're definitely talking about. We'll look into uh, how far we get down that path for version one of this game is uh, hard to tell. Well, either way, it would be a rather expensive process, so I think that would probably help you out in, just, uh, in figuring out where the zero um, part would come from. Exactly. I agree. Thank you. Um, Unity is one of the main development packages for the Oculus Rift. Any yep. plans to incorporate? Uh, yeah, we've left that as we have a $2.5 million stretch goal. Cool. Which but I predict we'll meet, by the way. So yeah. we're, we're looking at it carefully. We, you know, we're continuing to hopefully bring on more. You know, if any of you guys are not yet uh, participants, so I know we had one uh, that was up a little earlier. Uh, get your friends and family to join us, too. If we get to the 2.5, it's something we would love to do. I actually predict we will get there. Uh, but uh, we don't want to promise it until we've reached the stretch goal to, to know for sure we can pay for the extra person that we'll require to, to do it. Cool, thanks. Thank you. Uh, so I believe I've been playing Ultima since 4, and I've always played a sort of rogue, backstabby, steely kind of character. All right. <laughs> so is there anything you can tell me about a uh, stealth or rogue-ish system? There will be features to support you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh -huh. <laughs>
Uh, hello. Um, I guess my question is mainly about item customization. Because when I'm playing Skyrim, I forged a suit of steel armor, which I made personally. But it looks exactly like every other suit of steel armor in the game, lest it be in the cold regions or the desert. I'm honestly curious, is there any way to make an armor or weapon your own, like color it? Yes, so uh, so we're very much with you. That the, the, the real joy of a piece of armor is making it your own. Uh, and so we, we were actually discussing last night at dinner, uh, tracking the histories of, of objects. Uh, but uh, something we didn't discuss last night at dinner, but we were discussed as a team, is how you can add emblems or colorization or other things to make your uh, pieces of armor unique. We think having un truly unique items as, you know, the, the most boring thing in the world to be go to a shop and you see, look, they have ten generic daggers for sale and five generic swords for sale. What you really want to do is take the time to look at the meat and go, like, oh, this one is, you know, good for killing dragons because it's already slain the kings of the twelve dragons of the. I made that up, <laughs> but uh, uh, but anyway, you get the idea. So yes, we want to have the unique uh, weapons based upon their histories and unique weapons based upon uh, what you've done to forge them. Thanks. I'm happy that at least one developer is on me with that. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, and we'll just take these last two questions and we'll call it our, you, you two and then we'll stop. Okay, uh, can you hear me? I can. Uh, okay, I kind of have to get on my tippy toes. <laughs> um, I was just wondering if there would be like, kind of like in Skyrim, you, well, a lot of uh, Skyrim references here. Um, anyways, <laughs> if you, game. you can like, it is. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you can like throw fireballs and all that. Will you be able to do that in uh, Shroud of the Avatar? Absolutely. Okay, I also had a question. Can you like, um, kind of in like enchant your weapons like if I want to have a sword that can set people on fire could I be able to do that? Absolutely. I know it's awesome. a, okay. I notice a really pyromaniac theme yeah. in your <laughs> vein of your questions. Are any adults here with you? Do you have a pack of matches in your pocket? Uh, you have a great career as a fireman ahead of you. <laughs> I'm very excited so uh, thanks. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thanks and you get the honor of the last question, sir. Thank you. Uh, well, I've been a big fan of your career, sir, for a long time. And uh, thanks. beyond Shroud of the Avatar, what's next for Richard Garriott? Oh, oh good question. Uh, because Shroud of the Avatar, thank you, but you know, Shroud of the Avatar, uh, any of you that are involved like UO, these things have a life that hopefully is forever. And uh, so we've broken up Shroud of the Avatar into pieces we believe we could deliver on a timely basis. And so uh, uh, we already, you know, with, with Forsaken Virtues, the first episode of Shroud of the Avatar, that will be then followed by things we have internal names for, but not yet public names, for episodes two, three, four, and five, which are all blocked out. They're the story framework is done between me and Tracy. Uh, we know at least some fraction of the, of the feature sets we'll be bringing on uh, with each of those. But that's going to keep us busy for, you know, maybe a decade. So, uh, you know, we'll be happy if that, that's as far ahead as I can think. Good enough for me. Thank you. Yeah. But in any case, again, thank you all so much for coming out. Thank you much. For those of you who are backers already, thank you so much. For those of you who are not yet, please come join us on the website that you can see there, shroudoftheavatar.com. And uh, we'll, be ha we'll, we'll all go outside and chat with you all for a little bit if any people have other questions and things too. So. And also, if there's, uh, if there's more questions that you didn't get off here or you come up with questions after you leave, we do dev chats about once a week live where we get on a Google Hangout and we'll take questions and answer questions. So if and you come up with anything, and thank save you, Star.